Hello everybody and welcome to a love letter to Warsim. This is a little game that I've been following throughout Early Access for a number of years now, and I'm going to give you a real quick reason why I think you should pick it up and play it. The first thing to note is that it is an entirely ASCII war sim, or kingdom management game, kind of a light 4X, that plays entirely in a command line window and runs in ASCII. As a side note, the game can also be played entirely on a screen reader if you're visually impaired. The game is also cheaper than an average meal at McDonald's, considering it's $12.99 Canadian, which means it's about $10 USD. When setting up the game initially, it might look kind of small, so if you follow these quick steps, you can very easily fix it and make it a full screen game. Also select whatever, your font, whatever font you want, even Comic Sans. As for gameplay, WarSim is a kingdom management game. It, can, it is played using the keys 1 through 9 and 0 on the keyboard. You can play it on a numpad or, alternatively, using the number keys along the top of the keyboard. Gameplay-wise, the game works in several steps. You design your world, give it a generation, design the kind of species you want in your world. The game has 90 million something odd combinations of different creatures, ranging from dwarves, titans, demons, monsters, human-like things, weird underground things made of gems, all the way up to weird giant titans that are the size of the planet. After you've selected your races and your music option, then at that point you can select what you want to be. Do you want to be a king, queen, or a custom? You can literally name yourself whatever you want. I did a playthrough as Santa a couple of years ago and it was kind of hilarious. After selecting your title, you then proceed to name yourself. And then you name your kingdom. From there you can select your difficulty. This game will be really mean to you on insane. I would recommend playing on normal, but if you want it to be a very casual, just kind of raffle stompy experience, feel free to play on casual. After that, the game then proceeds to generate your world and give you some interesting-ish things to look at and play with. After your world is generated, the game then prompts you a few things, because the game would like to know our character's backstory. So obviously the previous ruler was our father and they were assassinated, and we didn't really want the throne, but we got the throne anyway. And then of course after that, we are informed by the old crow that we are raised to the heir as the land and prepared to assume the role upon our father's death. Of course, we are invited to our royal crowning ceremony, where we can learn of our nearby inherited realm. Of course, we don't care and are a spoilt rotten brat and would not do such a silly, stifling, old-fashioned thing. Skip the ceremony and get straight to business. And then the game prompts us if we would like to see a tutorial. There is actually a quite well-written, in-depth tutorial in this game. However, I find the simple tutorial significantly more amusing. It informs you that using all the menus will allow you to win. Then it allows us to review the tutorial if we so wish. And then we get to see our gameplay screen. This is where you can recruit, sell, and disband troops, hire mercenary companies, and manage staff and companions, and arrange diplomacy and change the laws of the land. From here, there are many different places that we can explore, and this video is going to take a little bit of a let's play format for the next little bit. The optimal outcome for the rest of this video is for me to run through one year of time in WarSim, showing you approximately what you can expect from a turn of play, and also what happens in a year of WarSim and kind of what the gameplay loop looks like. Initially, when you're first starting out, you're kind of broke. You don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of men, and people kind of hate you. Uh, the goal of the game is to make people as happy as possible, or as pissed off as possible, or take as much land as possible, and simply grow an empire. At the end of 25 years, if you select the default time period, you will be given a score. Of course, you could extend this to 50 or 100 or even infinite. Also, keep in mind the game comes with three built, uh, several built-in mods, including a Dwarf Fortress-themed mod, if that's what you're into. Simply find, you can find those by simply loading them up as a save file from the main menu of the game. Now, this game is a pretty open sandbox. It's pretty free what you can do. And some things are repeated from run to run. I've made a fortune doing nothing but literally just gambling on fights in my own arena until I eventually buy the arena and become some sort of gladiator state. We've also had runs where I summon an army of demons and talk to an evil mirror and slowly go insane before being assassinated. I've also had runs in this game where I simply enslaved everybody and forced them all to wear hats and then got really really drunk until they killed me before my term was over. It's a very fun variety filled little video game but requires a little bit of effort from the player to actually get that stuff out of it. So what we're going to do very first before we go visit anybody and before we go see anything, before we do anything else, we are going to go look at the sell and recruit and disband troops option. So we can hire units here, we can sell units here, we can disband units here, and we can disarm and convert units. Now the problem with games like this and getting into games like this is what can I do? Why do I want to be doing the things I can do? Well in this game, in the first turn you don't really need to worry too much about this unless you immediately want to start attacking people. But for this particular playthrough what we're going to be doing is we are going to be jumping into a ranged diplomacy. Let's see who else is in this world. So we can see that there are rebels who we are at war with. We can actually look at them. It tells us they have a minus 28 reputation with us. Uh, they 
we currently have 2,000 gold coins, and in order to bribe them to stop raiding me, I need 18,000, or I can bribe them to disband for 500, uh, for a big number. We'll just say big number. That's a lot of zeros. We can read about the rebels uh, by pressing number three. And we can see that the rebellion stemmed from, uh, from political tensions. The bastard of the old king's brother, Faradel, killed his cousin, and the prince led a revolt against the kingdom. It is even rumored that Faradel was behind the king's assassination, and he had a great deal of support in the kingdom, and it has been so greatly divided that once that was once a grand empire is now a shallow shadow of its former self, and many enemies of the crown of Dumb Place founded the rebellion under Faradel, and his thugs managed to gain a great foothold in the outer parts of Dumb Place land. Well, that's horrific. Well, we definitely need to avoid these guys and maybe fight with them at the end of this turn so I can show you what the combats look like. Of course, there's also the Bandit Horde and the re Legions of Greenskins. Uh, there appears to, appears to be the Kingdom of Krut and the Kingdom of Erak. Of course, there are then the Independent Territories, and this is where the variety comes in. If you look at the Independent, independent ter Territories, you can see that we have the Macrim, we have the Corpse Breakers, we have the Great Dynasties, the Midlands Community, and the Storm County. Just... To take a quick peek, let's take a peek at the first one. Uh, they are Hollow Void Aquamancers, whatever the hell that is. And there are uh, 168 of them, and they have seven total lands, which means they're probably very big and strong. We can also see a little image of what their flag looks like up here in the top left. And as you can see, your head diplomat, the old crow, tells you that the diplomatic action with Macrim is not possible due to their lack of civility and savage nature. And he confirms that they dislike us and see us as an enemy. Well, that's good to know. Of course, if we got rich enough, theoretically, we could bribe them. We're also at war with three independent lands. Let's check one that we're not at war with. Uh, we can see that the Midlands community is, a gr is run by Guru Bran Hardswig, and there's 810 of them. They don't have a ton of wealth, and they have five lands, and they are faithless, faceless bush oracles. Again, whatever the heck that is. We could dive deeper into who they are, or theoretically, if we wanted to, uh, attempt to vassalize them. Maybe declare war on them, or ask them if they want to be our friends. But considering this is still just the first turn, I think what we're just going to do is arrange our own diplomacy. Now, um, or rather, arrange our own laws, which is the fifth option. So our scribe has brought to you and unveils a fresh scroll eagerly awaiting the new laws and edicts. Well, obviously, we're going to go into taxes. Uh, of course, we're going to remove a gambling tax, which makes people happy and gives us less money per year. But, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it increases people happiness. Um, we're also going to... Uh, at, we're, we're gonna keep the land tax for a little bit, and we're gonna subsidize the arena, which allows us to bet more on the arena. We're also going to uh, not tax the taxes tax, because taxing people's tax equals more taxes on taxes. That's a good way to make a lot of money and make everybody really mad. Um, since we're in here under taxes and subsidies, we're also gonna now jump into goblin policies. Do we want to... Um, pay bounties to kill goblins? Do we want to ban goblin slavery or begin the goblin celebration and make the goblins happy and make them all move in? These are all options that we could do and can change the way the goblins interact with us. Of course, there's also the very important other others rule, which is uh, including you uh, slavery and uh, personal masters and missed titles. Uh, we could change our own titles. So if we want to change uh, what people refer to us as, we can do that in here. Uh, we can, of course, change our name or our other things and uh, the very fun ones, such as forgiving all outlaws and forcing everybody to wear hats. Naturally, we're going to force everybody to wear hats because it does absolutely nothing except for make the icons fun. So, now that we're forcing everybody to wear hats, uh, we can uh, check out our throne room. There are 22 people that wish to speak with us. Welcome to your throne room. You can deal with visitors from across your realm and beyond. As time goes on, you may find a number of visitors swelling to huge lines as a ruler. You may come to deal with my last visitor, but... If, if, if this task becomes too monotonous, you can look to hiring a steward, which will automatically fill off these visitors, and uh, they will have their own biases. So some of them will always put people in prison, and some people will not. We could hire somebody to deal with this, but initially, we just want to dive in. The game is now going to inform us of the problems that can come with having a steward, but... We're not going to worry about that. So send in a couple visitors and we shall see them. Uh, you are visited by a cloaked figure who seems to have appeared before your, you unnoticed by your guards. He identifies himself as a member of the Shadow Assassins and offers you his services for a price. We're going to inquire about this. Um, the Dark One ruler, Macrim, uh, 8,400 gold. Personally, so we can assassinate the ruler of Macrim. That's amazing. Uh, the King Bonewalker, which uh, had a ruler of the of the Corpse Breaker for 3,600 gold. So essentially, he's offering us to assassinate assassinate fascinate somebody of importance for more money than we have. We unfortunately would not like to um, 
take his services at this time. We could theoretically hire him, but uh, I think we're just going to decline his serv services for this time. And he says, as you wish. He then proceeds to disappear off. We're then going to send in the next person. And uh, they says we are visited by a young boy who stands on his hands. Who, sta who stands with his hands out waiting. He would like us to give him a coin. We will give the child a coin. Um, then the next visitor comes in. And uh, your guards bring forward a man who is accused of being part of a small gang of bandits on the outskirts of your lands. We shall ask him to explain himself. And he says, I didn't do it. I swear. They're lying. We are going to ask the arresting guard for his statement. And he says, the guard informs you at least two people are said to have witnessed his crime. All right. Well, in that case, execute this bandit scum. Plus two public opinion, minus one bandit. Good success here for today. So that's kind of what it looks like to be going through everybody for your realm. There's a good variety from bards that want you to give them tips to uh, random people that just want to dance. I'm going to run through the rest of these and then we'll continue the video. After throwing a bunch of people in prison, accusing some people of crimes they didn't commit, uh, executing two people, and taking a bribe, uh, and giving a bribe in order to increase our public opinion, we have now finished seeing everybody in the soldiers' room. Now we have a few other things that we can do, which are good to do at the start of the, at the game. We're going to watch a fight in the arena. There are ten fights that are going to happen. We can watch the fight or bet on the fight. So naturally, we're going to bet. We're going to pay the entry fee to to bet on the fight, and we are going to, well, we have two options here. We have a goblin, warlord, and a, and a gladiator. Well, uh, man, I don't know who's going to win, but I'm going to put my money on the goblin, frankly. Uh, we have 977 gold, gold coins that we can bet, so we're going to bet a good hefty amount of 500. Naturally, uh, we've bet 500 coins. And then the gates slide open and two fighters emerge from the gates and the crowd is electric and their chanting can be heard for miles around. The warriors in charge prepare for death. And let's see. The gladiator swings at the goblin warlord, but he misses. The goblin warlord definitely has more HP than the, than, than the gladiator. The goblin warlord cracks the gladiator on the head with force and then hits him a second time as hard as possible. The goblin warlord gets a third hit in quick, fast jabs without even taking a hit. And uh, once again, gets a hit in. The gladiator finally swings back and hits the goblin warlord hard, taking him out for 48 HP. After another dice roll, though, it looks like the goblin warlord uh, has been victorious. Naturally, we won 750 gold from our bet. And then we're going to uh, bet another fight on this. Uh, we're going to bet again. Uh, so we now we have two options. We have Sunset Gilgul the Sea Lord versus Sir Grineth the Merciful. Well, obviously we don't want to vote on somebody merciful in a gladiator fight now. Nah. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to bet another... F eh, actually, let's bet the 750 that we just won because where's your sense of adventure? Uh, the number go up, right? That's the crowd wars and the two fighters emerge from either end of the arena. And the march, march ever closer for the bloodthirsty crowd. Watch closely, awaiting the first blow. Uh, it looks like our Sunset Sunset Lord is definitely off to a bad start after taking two real quick hits and losing some HP. However, uh, it takes a second bad hit and a third bad hit and a... Eh, okay. Finally, our Sunset Gilgul the Sea Lord cracks or grill the Merciful on the head. Fortunate for us, he gets another hit in. And okay, there's there's some dodges. Uh, Sir Gildas shouts, "You should have chosen a different Shouts, "You should have chosen a different profession." Sir Grilgath the Merciful gets a pair of very fast strikes in on the Sea Lord, and it seems to be a pretty even fight here, honestly, because our uh, Sea Lord turns around and smacks him pretty well and stabs him not pretty good. Second hit for minus 25. Uh, Sunset Gilroy the sea, sea Lord swings for Sir Grayath, but misses by a wide margin. Uh, but then, the very end, Sunset Gilgul the Sea Lord gets a great hit on the Merciful, killing him dead. Not a bad round of betting, I say, for the arena. I say we back out. Let's go and do something else with our week. Let's go and explore the realm. So now we have three chances. And the way this works is you pick a zone, and there are many, many, many different zones that you can explore. Some of them may be destroyed on a run. Some of them may be active and alive. So each run, you're going to have some different variety of places that you will find. We're going to go to the northern lands, and I'm going to explore. So the way we do this is we hit 1, and we press Enter. We, we explore for a while, but we find nothing. We're going to try it again. We explore for a while, and we find a wandering group of 13 masterless soldiers. Their leader steps forward and says, His men will join you for no less than 35 gold each. That's actually not a bad price, so we're going to take them. So we get 33 soldiers for 11.55. Sweet. 
um, we're going to move again, and we lose another exploration chance. So since we're only going to be doing one turns, that is all that we can do for exploration in this particular video. Because what will happen is this will slowly expand as you discover things, and you'll find places that you can explore that have multiple, multiple screens within screens of different quests and things that you can go on, different tasks, different other betting mini games, and other such things such as sitting in a bar and getting drunk or reading old books. There's also weird events and stuff that you can do that will change the way the world works in the throne room. It's quite cool and actually self-references is, is it, itself in ways with different people that can show up in the throne room. So we're going to back out of the exploring screen and now we're going to visit a few other things. So we can visit the Royal Bank under nine. Here we can deposit gold, we can withdraw gold, and we can spend gold. And the other thing that we can do from from within the bank is if we do deposit a bunch of gold, it will gain interest as the years go by. Currently, we don't really have anything in there. It's, it's just 827, so it's not much. But hey, we do have stuff. And if we get really, really broke, we can also uh, rob our own bank. Um, from there, uh, there are other buildings that are in the kingdom. So currently we just have a prison with a couple people that I just threw in there, as well as uh, we could build a library, we could build an artifacts hall, we could build an explorer's guild, and we could build a training ground, and we could build an, a hall of order. All things that you worry about in later game, not to be worried about too early on. If we jump to the kingdom's upgrade screen, we can see that we have military buildings, and these all give us various different perks towards our military. We also have guilds and other buildings. Obviously, you can see those things that we were just seeing, plus two explore chances per turn for the Explorer's Guild. Uh, we can get our own knightly order, which basically makes our soldiers way better. Uh, terraformers, which allows us to make barren lands that we can capture, and you will capture barren lands, useful. And uh, also an emissary hut, which is plus one emissary when uh, contacting adventurers. And a slaver's guild, which allows us to get a stream of slaves each turn, which increases our workforce and lowers our public opinion and, you know, changes some things around. Of course, it is very much a sandbox. Down under other buildings, there are some fun ones as well, including this Goblin Slaver's personal guard if we want it to be more likely that we'll get Goblin Slaves every turn and such. And if you just want to enslave, you know, everybody, you could also just do that as well. Of course, who doesn't want a monster pit in their throne room to throw people into? Now, for the sake of this video, because I want to keep it a reasonable length of time, we're going to end the current year. Of course, normally I would probably play out all of those fights as well as to try and maximize my turns a little bit more, but I just want to show you the gameplay loop. We are going to attack the Bandit Horde because screw them, and uh, we're just going to send out a little skirmish. And General Packner says, I fight for the day, where well, the Bandit Horde is not but a memory. And uh, we're going to send everybody, naturally, because who needs to defend ourselves? I mean, come on. And uh, they say, my lord, do you wish to watch the battle? Of course I wish to watch the battle. So, the full moon that adorns the battlefield. Do you wish to launch the attack or wait in hope for a favorable weather? Uh, we will attack because winter or at nighttime is a good time to attack. Uh, no weather events during the battle. Good. Calm weather. We have a plus two initial battle strength. Uh, and then beneath the full moon, your army marches out shouting to meet their rival. Your army maintains its composure and bursts forward to confront the enemy. Um, it appears that we lost uh, 12 soldiers and 27 pe peasants on the battlefield, and they lost three bandit warlords and 26 uh, things. So uh, enemy troops remaining 604 and ours remaining 700. I feel like we kind of got wrecked there, but also they have less soldiers to begin with. Uh, so on the next turn, it seems like things went a little bit better. We push forward and outflank the bandits, but still no one seems to have the upper hand. We are still overall winning in the numbers, and it does look like we are crushing them slowly. This is a good round, though, for us. You managed to take both of the enemy's flanks, tripping them momentarily and doing damage before they pull back. It's a good thing we bought those extra soldiers, I gotta tell you. That was a rough turn. Ooh, boy. Um, considering this is just a skirmish and not an all-out fight, this could go badly for us. You managed to form an effective pincer and, over and overrun your opponent's flanks. All right, well, let's power through the rest of these turns as the fight goes. And the battle rages on, and a group of local peasants and farmers hide behind some rocks and bushes and watch the fight. Two of them argue over being quiet until a third peasant shouts for them both to shut up. And, uh, well, okay, we are still ahead. We still have the numbers advantage. As the battle rages on, a group of small children climb atop some trees over the battle field to watch intently. Uh, we're still... Okay, that was a really good turn for us, because look at that. We managed to take both of the enemy's flanks once again. Uh, I just hope that we have the numbers advantage right and down until the end. The skirmish was a success, and your troops survive, and the enemy force lays dead. Minus five relation with bandits. So now we can view the full battle report. 
Um, you, the bandits lost a total of 633 troops in battle, and we lost, and uh, we we lost a total of 577 troops. So that was pretty bad for us, actually. Um, we can now pay some egghead to create a fancy battle report for us, but yeah, I don't need that. It's fine. We're gonna stop viewing battle reports, and then they're gonna ask us, "My lord, we are under attack from rebels. Uh, do you want to see the battle, or uh, can you?" Get the resultant reports. We'll take the resultant reports. The skirmishing force of the rebels have trampled your forces and won the battle. Well, that's not good. Um, and then uh, we're going to stop, stop viewing battle reports. And then they say that we're being attacked again. Uh, and then uh, we are being attacked again. Um, and uh, let's see. We are, uh, the Herbering Mouse Eater, the leader of, has stepped... Okay, well, Herbling the Mouse Eater, the leader of, the of my militia, has stepped down in shame after the scandal within the militia ranks. Gosh, I wonder why. Um, and it looks like we received word that adventurers from Meridim have killed... I've been killed by Wirt Dusk Scouts Bandits. Well, that's interesting. Um, and now we can read through a simple report uh, for the kingdom, um, which informs us that uh, we received 1,606 gold from trade, harvest, and tax and tributes, and your peasants earned 25 gold this year from this harvest. Um, we spend 1,000 gold on the arena and are now in debt, I think, and our treasury has decreased by 189 gold, and we earned a little bit of interest. Also, it looks like a bunch of people beat, beats us. Um, so... You know, we are a dumb place after all. We now have 299 gold, 101, 101 men, still have five lands, and people still don't really love us and they don't really hate us. That is one round of war sim. You know, obviously we could go through and we could recruit more troops. We could simply lose our riches betting it on the arena. We could go and explore the realm and discover other lands. This is a game that's really captured my imagination in the past, and I really would like some other people to pick it up, especially now that it is out of early access and in 1.0. If this game interests you and you check it out, let me know down in the comments section. If you want to see more videos like this, let me know as well. Of course, this is going to be a little bit higher editing than most of the things that I do, so videos like this won't happen very often. But if it is interesting to you and you would like to see more, do let me know. Thank you very much for watching this video. Check out WarSim, and I hope to see you in the next one.